So much on my mind Keep it all in line Juggling tasks that fall from the sky Oh, what a scene Somewhere on this road There is a load that's lighter for me Show me the road that's lighter for me Welcome to episode 11 of the parenting series, Chaos to Calm. I'm Noelle Kirshner, a mother, minister, and writer who has published in places like the Huffington Post, the Today Show Parenting Team, and Mamapedia. I'm also a syndicated devotion writer for I Believe and Crosswalk.com. In this series, I explore how we can turn family chaos into calm. The Bible can help us do that. My guest today has written one of the most popular Bible versions on the market. I am delighted to welcome my third New York Times best-selling author to the set, Sally Lloyd-Jones. Sally's Bible, the Jesus Storybook Bible, has won the Platinum Book Award with over 3 million copies sold. The Wall Street Journal and the New York Times both give her work critical acclaim. Sally is a New York-based author who has performed her stories and poems in a 12-city tour with Amy Grant and Ellie Holcomb. Stay tuned to the end of the episode to find out how two lucky viewers will win an anniversary edition of her Bible, along with four of her other books. Welcome, Sally. Thank you so much for having me, Noel. It's such a delight to have you here in person. I first heard about your Jesus Storybook Bible and my son received it at preschool like I was explaining yes. before the show almost a decade ago wow. and I have been a great fan of yours ever since and I'm just so excited to um, get into all the questions that I'm burning to ask you certainly about your Jesus Storybook Bible book um, but also some others and I thought we'd start about learning a little bit about you can you tell me a little more about your background? I read that you were born in Uganda. Yes, I was born in Kampala, Uganda. Wow, now why were you there? My dad was working for Shell. So we really? were there and then we lived in Kenya, in Nairobi. So I, I was very comfortable being away from home, always. It was and an adventure. So what led you to New York? How did you go from so, Africa to New York City? <laughs> via <laughs> London and Paris and, you know, how your lives go. Um, I saw a job advertised and I was working as an editor in London, okay. doing almost what I wanted to do, sort of not thinking I was good enough at writing, so I was working on other people's writing. And I saw a job advertised and I thought, oh, I could go for a year. And that was in 1989. And here I am still. New York captured your yes. heart, as yeah. it has um, me as well. I have to say, when I lived in New York City, I loved walking through Central Park. And I've seen some of your posts in Central Park. It sounds like it captivates oh, you, it too. Oh, it does. I love it. And it was, it was one of those things built by generosity. The designers, mm -hmm. their whole goal, probably you know this, but I, I was so blown away when I found out the whole reason for Central Park is that they wanted people who couldn't afford to leave the city to go to the country. They thought, well, we'll bring the country into the city. Wow. Isn't that beautiful? It's beautiful. And I see this kind of country theme throughout your life. Yes. I um, love the country. So it's funny that I'm in the city. But yeah. I think it keeps me on my, on my toes. I think if I lived in the country, I could become a bit peculiar. More <laughs> peculiar than I am. <laughs> <laughs> well, we love peculiarity. <laughs> I think peculiar is great. Oh, I think it's fantastic. <laughs> so um, you had a job that took you to New York. Was it a writing job? No, it was editing. And then okay. I got laid off in massive cutbacks in 2000. Oh, my goodness. But it was one of those cliche things that it turned out to be the very best thing I could have hoped to happen. I didn't think that at the time. But right. looking back, it's, it's what Tim Keller says. If you knew everything God's doing in your life, he, you would cheer him on. If you knew all he knows about what he's doing. So if I'd known in 2000 what he was really up to, I would have been cheering him on, but of course, no, I was very anxious and where's my, as you know, as we all are. Right, but, well, understandably yeah, so. But right? that's what launched me out as a writer, because I thought, well, if I don't try now, when am I ever going to? So did the offer to write the Jesus Storybook Bible shortly follow that period? Yes, and I think it's interesting because, because I needed money, God had me in a position where I just kept saying yes to everything. Now, if I hadn't 
been in that sort of difficult position, I might not have had the vision that he was going to give me of what this Bible could be. Because when I started work on it, I thought, limit, in my limited vision, oh, this is for the church. And I knew my calling was really for, for people who've never come to church. So it didn't kind of work in my tiny way of thinking. I didn't know God would give me a book that would reach everyone. So he got me in the right position by making it that I didn't have enough money. So I like to tell people that because, you know, he'll use every, everything to get you where he needs you to be, to give you what he has you to do. Oh. And I'm so grateful. I could think on just that quote for a long time. Mm -hmm. And in fact, on this show and on my blog, I've talked a lot about life purpose. And I believe so much about what you're saying mm -hmm. about sometimes those inconveniences, those even heartbreaks along the yes. way can be a setback that's temporary for mm -hmm. a set up yes. for something amazing. Absolutely, it's a promotion. Like mm -hmm. Joseph was, he had to go down to the dungeon. That's right. And which looked like the worst possible thing, but he was, that was the only way he could become Prince of Egypt. And that was the only way he could save all of God's people. So we have all these stories that tell us the truth of that. Yeah. It's just hard in the moment. But then I think if we've got friends telling us the truth, we don't have to worry if we don't quite believe it. We've got those friends who can encourage us and we can, we can do that thing of I believe, help my unbelief, mm -hmm. which I love that. You know? Well, or we could even pick up the Bible and read these stories and immerse ourselves in that hope yes. that again and again, yes. God holds true, so true. Um, to his promises. You said something that interests me. You said that your calling, you feel, has always been for people outside of the church. Yes. Can you tell me a little bit more about that and how that led to this yes. project? Well, I've always, I've always thought, you know, we know the comfort and hope and joy that we get from our relationship with God. But there are so many people who need that same hope. And I'm thinking of children because they're my call. And I think, well, children need to know that, you know, the world is a very scary place and it's scary right now. They need to know that someone loves them and loves them unconditionally. So whether I'm writing a book about a little bird that feels too small and doesn't know what she can bring to the world, which is my book, Baby Wren, or if I'm writing a Bible story, at the heart of my call is to speak God's love to children, whether it's through you belong, you matter, there's a place for you, or a specific Bible story that tells you know, directly what has happened in the Bible. But I, I really do know that my calling is to all children, all races, all creeds, to, for them to know there's a God who loves you. And that message is so apparent when you pick up this Bible. I have to say, um, now it doesn't just come in this beautifully illustrated form, mm -hmm. right? It comes without the illustrations yes. in almost an adult version because adults enjoy reading yes. this Bible so much too. It has personally impacted my faith and made the events of Jesus's life so personal. So I'm wondering, as you were conceiving this project and so much of your faith is on the page, how do you conceive of your faith? What role does it play in your daily life? Well, you know, as a small child, when I was about four, I, I, my dad came home from a missions conference and he would heard about this woman who would said to her daughter, darling, would you like Jesus to come into your heart? And she'd said yes, and it was lovely. So he came home and I was on my tricycle. We were in Africa and I stopped my tricycling and he said, darling, would you like to invite Jesus into your heart? And I said, no, thank you, and tricycled <laughs> off. But I tell that story because first of all, children know that they're not just gonna blindly say yes to things. Fortunately, later that year I said yes, and so there's no, never been a time I didn't know Jesus was my best friend. And mm -hmm. that was comforting to me when I went to boarding school by myself. I knew he was with me. But I wasn't really quite so sure about God. I had this idea that even though Jesus, so I had this idea, I think a lot of people do this. Jesus is my best friend, but God is the hard taskmaster. So while I knew Jesus loved me, I wasn't sure God did. I thought if I'm not doing it right, God won't love me. So I'd read a story about Daniel in the lion's den. And I'd think, as a, I remember thinking this when I was about six, I'd think, imagining in bed, that I'm gonna be thrown to lions. And would I be brave enough to say I'm a Christian? And I, would, I knew I wouldn't. I would like, no, I'm, not, I'm gonna pretend I'm not a Christian. So then I would feel condemned and like, well, God can't love me because I'm not doing it right. Wow. And so I had this funny mix. Mm -hmm. And I think that, that was very crucial to me to have children know 
no, God is the one who loves you as much as Jesus. They both love, you know, it's, God is the one who gave his son. So my whole goal was to show that the Bible is a love story and it's the father from the very beginning who will do, move heaven and earth to be near you. Because once you know that God loves you at great cost to himself, it changes everything. Because then you know he already knew he couldn't do it. You know, it's not about us getting it all right so we can be perfect, so God will love us. So that was, I really wanted children to know, first of all, they're loved. Because it's out of that, changed lives happen. It is. And in every single story in the Bible, you relate back to Jesus' love. So to me, it's not just the message, it's how it's woven through this entire book mm -hmm. in such a new and fresh way by connecting all of these voices together into one harmony yes. um, that is so impactful. And as I'm hearing you say this, Sally, I would love for you to just read um, a little bit from this book because I think it is absolutely illustrative of what we're talking about now and I just I'd love hearing to. your I voice. I love to do that. <laughs> um, my pleasure. I'll just read this from here. Yeah. So this is the introduction. God wrote, I love you. He wrote it in the sky and on the earth and under the sea. He wrote his message everywhere because God created everything in his world to reflect him like a mirror, to show us what he's like to help us know him, to make our hearts sing. And God put it into words too and wrote it in a book called the Bible. The Bible is most of all a story. It's an adventure story about a young hero who comes from a far country to win back his lost treasure. It's a love story about a brave prince who leaves his palace, his throne, everything to rescue the one he loves it's like the most wonderful of fairy tales that has come true in real life. You see, the best thing about this story is, it's true. There are lots of stories in the Bible, but all the stories are telling one big story. The story of how God loves his children and comes to rescue them. It takes the whole Bible to tell this story. And at the center of the story, there is a baby. Every story in the Bible whispers his name. He is like the missing piece in a puzzle, the piece that makes all the other pieces fit together and suddenly you can see a beautiful picture. And this is no ordinary baby. This is the child upon whom everything would depend. This is the child who would one day, but wait, our story starts where all good stories start, right at the very beginning. Oh, That's I called a cliffhanger. That. It is a cliffhanger. <laughs> I love cliffhangers. And it makes me want to dive in more right now. Um, thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you. It's not just the words, it's how you read it. It's just beautiful. Thank you. I'm um, very honored that God gave me this book to do. When I was watching one of your interviews, because as I said, I've been a fan for a long time, you said something really interesting. You said that who you were as an eight-year-old child informs what you do today. Yes. And it informs, I mean, just, I'm being mesmerized as I'm listening to you. You seem to be channeling children. Can you tell me a little bit about who you were as an eight-year-old girl and how it's impacting oh, yes. you today? Because have you, have you heard that where people say, whoever you were before you became aware of who you were supposed to be is your real, true person? And you'll look back and, for me, that meant that I was actually, right, make, I read, the first book I ever read all the way through was Edward Lear's The Complete Nonsense, which most people in America haven't heard of, but they must find it at once. Especially if you have a child who's not really into reading. They may not love it, but I loved it. And it, I never knew that you could have so much fun inside books, because I thought, and I was a dreamy child, so I wasn't sort of head of the class or anything. I was looking out the window. But... So I thought books were going to show me how stupid I was. Mm -hmm. This book was a revelation because he was writing silly rhymes and drawing silly pictures. And so from then on, I made up my own limericks and inflicted them on anyone, my parents, my family, my friends, <laughs> and drew pictures. And whenever a girl at boarding school had birthday, I would do a cartoon. Well, the interesting thing is I haven't really, I took all those years in publishing and everything and coming to America and not until middle of the 2000s did I find out, oh, 
that's what it is. I've got to have fun inside books, and that's what I do. I, I think my, if I was to put it in a word, it's to bring joy to children. So what, you, what I knew as a seven or eight year old is what I'm doing now. So I think I say that to parents and anyone that maybe there's something in your life that you've a dream that you let go of. It may not be, I'm very fortunate that I can earn a living through what I love in that way. But it doesn't have to be your living, it could be a hobby. But I, I do believe whatever you loved as a child should be somewhere in your life, could be somewhere in your life. I greatly agree with that. Parker Palmer has talked a lot about that. And I've, um, there's one quote in particular where he talks about how he observes his granddaughter and he writes down all the things he sees her um, demonstrating well, that's beautiful. because he wants her to return to those letters oh. later in his you know later in her life when he's gone oh, that's beautiful um, and it's a kind of love story yeah. to her so that she would rediscover that's in beautiful. some sense um, some of the earliest traces of who she was because as adults we can forget can't well, we, we can get very serious and sensible and maybe we're too scared I know I was to really let that dream come back you know, I had I put it on hold. I kept thinking, no, I wasn't brave enough. I didn't live my dream. I always want because I always wanted to be a writer or an actor or maybe both, and I didn't do either. So I'm in publishing, and I'm really, if you talk to me, like I can't remember, you know, before 2000, I would have been saying, yeah, it's great, but I'm a bit of a coward. I haven't this, that, and the other. But the truth was, God had it all, and it, in God's timing, it worked. If I, you know, all of those years were essential training. Mm -hmm. So. Mm. I love thinking about that. Um, I love thinking about how all the pieces of our lives can come together into what our one calling is. Yes. And how yes. interesting that the performance I know. Um, I has know. even come back too because you were on tour. I know, and um, I love, I mean, performing, it sounds like I might be dancing, but fortunately not, or singing. <laughs> but I found that there's this synergy just organically happened between songwriters and me, and I realize we have similar, we, we both are telling a story in two languages, you know, word and illustration, and in a song it's obviously music and word. And when you put those together, you're telling a story in three languages. So that's kind of interesting to me. Mm. And so in, a way, in many ways it makes sense, and I am so grateful because I, I love to read and I, I don't get scared. Mm -hmm. So it is, it's equipping, and the other thing, I studied art history, though everyone told me it would lead nowhere. But what kind of books do I write? I write very visual, very, you know, they're illustrated. Yes. So actually art history was the perfect training. But none of that did I plan. I just followed my, what I loved. And it led which you. Which doesn't always work, but, you know, I was fortunate. God was... Well, hearing leading. you say that, I remember hearing the illustrator of the Jesus Storybook Bible interviewed, uh, Jago, and yes. he says, you know, Oftentimes I get a project and it's after the author is done with it and I do my thing, but Sally wanted to be very involved mm -hmm. and it blessed the project yes. because you worked together yes. in some sense to create these gorgeous illustrations. Yeah. I think it's a really, well, he's a lovely, you know, it doesn't always work and mostly it doesn't. You don't, the publisher doesn't let you meet the illustrator, but Jago's wonderful and I think the, because we could collaborate like that, it's better because then the book, what you want in a picture book is it, you want it to look as if the one who illustrated it could have written it or the one who wrote it could have illustrated it. So that in other words, it's got the same, it's got one voice. Yes. And I think, yeah, I'm, I mean, truthfully, if Jago hadn't illustrated the book, we wouldn't be here talking about it. Wow. Because it's, the illustration is the front door of the book. So unless the, like if the illustration isn't right, my text stands no chance. So if Jago hadn't illustrated it, my book would not be what it is. What I'm hearing from you is a passion for excellence. Yes. Can you say a yes. little bit more about that? Well, I used to think excellence, that was elitist, you know. I've come to think it's the opposite. I think if you, I think beauty is an apologetic. I think excellence, it means nothing's in the way of the story. It's, for instance, if the typeface isn't excellent, it will be really hard to read. Now, we don't think about that. You'll probably pick up a book and you get exhausted reading the first page. It might be because the typeface is really hard to read. Because mm. design is really good design, you don't notice. It's just easy. And I think the same with a d design of a book, you know. If it's excellent, nothing's in the way of the story. So you open the book and the story, you, there's no barrier. Mm -hmm. In writing, if I'm all about my phrases and my, 
you know, I think Chesterton called them your darlings. If I've got some lovely phrase that I'm so thrilled with, I'm going to probably boil the story because it's all about me and my ego and my, I'm showing off with my phrase. But if I put the reader first, which in this case is the child, then I'm not going to insist on all my words because what that will do is have less room for the illustration. And mm -hmm. who's the one who suffers? The child. So you kind of have this choice. Will I be generous and let the story lead or will I be all about me and my ego? And, you know, so that's another way you have to constantly surrender to letting the story be the main thing. Mm -hmm. And because it's been the main thing, I think it's reached so many. Um, so when you think about, you, you keep going back to making your project accessible to the child. What do you think is most important when connecting with a child? I think it's your stance before them. And I think rather than coming from on high, especially when you're reading, I mean, there are places where you need to teach children. But in terms of story time and telling a story, I think you need to be on the ground at right eye level, which means humility. That you come before the child without thinking you know everything and they know nothing. To realizing, especially when you're dealing with a Bible story, we're all children with, before the Lord. And a child might teach you a great thing. You don't know. So I think the best way to read, for instance, this book is together wonder aloud at how amazing that this God, this God that we love has come to save us the adult and the child. And I think that gives children dignity as opposed to if you come at a child and you read a story and you try and teach a lesson out of it, that will just shut everything down because children don't need more lessons. They get plenty of lessons. What they need is to be taken seriously, let them listen to the story, choose the story well. And then I think you trust God to speak to the child and the child trust the child to hear from their Heavenly Father. And a story is like a seed. You don't really want to be messing around with a seed because you'll kill it. You just want to plant it and then leave it and just be like a good gardener. Mm. I love that. It, it almost makes story time sound like an adventure. I think so. That everybody's on the same level. You're approaching a story that has great wisdom and you come before it as a body of Christ, and the child can offer as much, yes. right? The imagination, the wonder, yeah. the, sh the love, the innocence, the trust. I mean, Scripture talks about that. Yeah. Um, Jesus heralds its power, right? Mm. And then adults bring their own lens that can bless it as Absolutely. well. Absolutely, and I think it takes I the pressure that. off parents because I think they can feel a bit like, oh, I'm reading this story, now I've got to sort of apply it. You don't. If it's a good story, you don't. There are other times that, there are that there's that to be done, but I think to trust the story. Stories are very powerful because mm -hmm. they're the ones, when you, when you listen to a sermon, what do you remember? It's the stories. Jesus, one out of every three times he taught, it was a story. So I think we need to just realize stories, we're, we're, we're made for stories, aren't we? Mm -hmm. I love that. And the greatest love story ever told, which is the Bible, that phrase will stick with me. Um, as your description of what God does through this book. So um, to switch gears a little bit, mm. this show is Chaos to Calm, and we're in a lot of chaos right now over the coronavirus. And not much calm. <laughs> not much <laughs> calm at all. And I'm wondering, given um, your passion for children and your faith background and ability to teach them, what advice would you have for worried parents who are looking to connect with their child and maybe even frame the coronavirus um, in some kind of uh, faith perspective? Well, I think the first thing is we as grown-ups have to get our anxiety under. We can't go to a child and try and calm them down if we're really anxious. And I speak about, you know, I'm talking to myself too. I think we have to come sorted out in terms of trusting God then we come to the child. I think what, what, what I heard someone say, and I think is a really good tip, is don't assume you know what the child is frightened of. Don't assume you know what their, what, what their questions are. So the first thing is ask them, what is it your worry is telling you? And I think separating worry from the child is good. It's like these worries are telling you something. They're whispering in your ear. What are they whispering? And the child might tell you something you hadn't even thought of, and then you can address it. But I think if we go in and give them too much information, we might actually be answering questions they didn't have and putting ideas in their head that are more anxious that they never even thought to worry about. 
I know I can fall victim to that. <laughs> well, we do because we want to really address the whole thing. But yes. I, children often haven't thought through everything. They don't need all that information. Mm -hmm. And some of them, if they're not even asking, you don't need to, I don't think you need to. Uh, that's my thought. Mm -hmm. And I also saw that you recently had a post on your website where you instructed people, in the words of Fred Rogers, to yes. look for the helpers. Yes, I love that. Because, you know, I live in New York City. So at the weekend, I went to a restaurant. No one was there, just me and my friend. But we had the most amazing interaction with the server in a, a way that was so different than we would have had in a normal everyday. And I'm finding that all throughout the city, these beautiful interactions. So that may not be a helper, but that's something beautiful in the middle of something really scary. Mm -hmm. And you could make it into a game, like what can we spot today that wouldn't have happened if it weren't for everyone panicking right now? Or, where can we find these helpers? And then your perspective is looking in the right direction. And that helps me. Absolutely. Know. It gives you that thread of hope. Yes. To and look, we're really... To look for. Yeah, sorry I interrupted. But mm -hmm. I, I'm thinking it's really the time we have to work our muscles, our faith muscles, don't we? Mm -hmm. Of trust. Mm -hmm. I mean, the truth is we've always been... Nothing's really changed in the sense that we aren't in control of anything. Mm -hmm. We just have the illusion that we are. And this virus has now made us all feel like, oh my word, we're not in control. Mm -hmm. I love that. Well, we're almost out of time, but in our few remaining minutes, I wonder um, what's next on the horizon for you? Do you have anything that you'd like to share that you're up to? Um, just to end on a, a note that, oh, sure. of course, is hopeful and, yeah. and exciting. Well, I've got a book coming out called, based on Psalm 139 with Jago, called Near, that oh. no matter where we go, God is right there with us. And another project is I've been starting to write songs with songwriters. So that's been an interesting experience. Oh, wonderful. Yeah. Well, so, I'd love to have you back on and we can maybe talk more back. about that. Thank yeah. you so much, oh, Sally, for being you. here today. Thank you so much for having me. Sally's wisdom has impacted millions through the page and in person. Her work makes the faith invitation fresh and meaningful. By slowing down and reading together, Listening for God's voice and experiencing God's love in new ways, we can infuse calm into family life. And now the giveaway. Thank you to the Christian publisher Zonderkids for teaming up with my show for the second time, this time offering a book bundle to two lucky viewers. Five of Sally's titles are up for grabs for each winner. Those titles are the anniversary edition of the Jesus Storybook Bible, her found and loved picture book set, her award-winning thoughts to make your heart sing, and her picture book, Bunny's First Spring. Simply go to my website, www.noelkirshner.com to register. Two winners will be chosen before Easter. Thank you to Central Presbyterian Church, where I serve as parish associate, and to HTTV for making this episode possible. Also, thank you again to Sally for appearing on the show today. If you want to learn more about her, her information will follow on screen. She is currently offering a free Lenten resource to subscribers on her website. Finally, please like and share this episode on social media if you found it helpful. Until next time, may calm be with you.